Project Lawful aka Plane Crash by Arwain, aka Eliezer Yudkowski and Lynn Tamande. The Woman of Irori, Episode 181. Two hundred and fifty seconds later. Carissa Sivar finds herself at her desk, with two discarded one-use items of modify memory at her side and a detailed packet of notes labeled, Don't read this, just take it to the most high immediately in her own hand. This is worse than a murder mystery, she thinks, after the first few seconds of panicked confusion are past. Security? Okay, security will immediately burst through this door then. I need an urgent teleport to Agorian, and also, if there's anyone who has been spying on my room, if there's some kind of remote surveillance setup, you don't need to tell me about it, but someone with knowledge of it needs to come with me on the urgent trip to Igorian. The Most High is going to have questions for them. There isn't that he knows about, but that's irrelevant. This gets routed to the new 7th Circle Commander via telepathic bond stat. Carissa Sevar will be out of the Forbiddance and on her way to Igorian before two minutes have elapsed. She will spend them staring at her own handwriting and wishing she had gotten some sleep before the next Project Lawful thing had to happen. Igorian. One might find it satisfying to imagine that Aspexia Rugaton had thought that Sevar was developing so nicely, that Project Lawful was going back under a firm hand, that everything was going normal and fine on Project Lawful, and then this happened. She obviously didn't think that. Aspexia Rugaton wouldn't have let herself think that even before she'd heard of tropes. Among the many dark, unspeakable facts you learn as the Grand High Priestess of Asmodeus is that projects which have had drama in the past will probably continue to have drama in the future. Aspexia Rugaton gave herself 24 hours in the palace, catching up on administrative matters, promotions and demotions, rewards and punishments, before returning to the front. 24 hours, starting from when Carissa Savar returned to Project Lawful. 24 hours later, as she departed for Nadal, having heard only good things out of Project Lawful, Aspexia made a private wager with herself about the chances of her being called back by some Project Lawful emergency within another 24 hours, once she was no longer conveniently at the palace and interruptible. Has she won or lost this wager? It doesn't really matter. Whoever won, Aspexia Rugaton loses. I'm pulling all of the current modify memory items from Project Lawful as soon as I've dealt with whatever madness this is, Rugaton states in tones of even, calm, impending murder. The utility to the Alani project, in retrospect, is not worth the massive vulnerability to the tropes created by having them around as potential plot devices. In the future, Project Lawful will have on staff one person who can use modify memory of the fourth circle spell form, as will be detectable by detect magic and reversible by break enchantment. How long has it been since you slept, Sevar? I slept before my debrief and departure from Igorian Most High. That would have been about two days ago. You look it. If we are truly fortunate, this packet only contains your mad ravings after you snapped due to sleep deprivation. What's the last event you allowed yourself to remember? I wasn't succeeding at falling asleep, so I decided to cast Owl's Wisdom and get some more work done on thinking about corrigibility. Now, there's the sort of topic somebody might choose if they were trying to distract Aspexia Rugaton about something. Fortunately, Project Lawful's current modify memory items are not at least the sort that alter memories. You are certain you remember that actually happening? You did not leave yourself a further note saying that it was what happened? No. Most high. I thought to myself I should try to make some progress on it, for its own sake and because it'd be a way of seeing if any of Pilar's new Ilani can set themselves apart, but only if I've made progress myself to judge theirs against. And then, nothing. Lovely. Shut up while I think. Aspexia Rugaton weighs the packet in her hands. She's no Ilani, but she's read every Project Lawful transcript and is very, very wise. The temptation to tear open the packet and read it immediately is strong. But there's an obvious thought here, which is that Savar went traitor, knew she couldn't pass detect thoughts past that point, and that this past Savar is a saying some gambit intended to get her less enhanced self out of Chiliax and to Keltum. 
This past Savar has INT-24, which is noticeably more cunning than Rugaton, even if that Savar remains much less wise than herself. Then it may be wiser for Aspexia to do her own thinking, at least briefly, before she opens the packet and allows it to poison her interpretations. Aspexia will make her predictions in advance, decide in advance which theories imply what, as Keltham always emphasized that an Alani should. If Sivar turned traitor the first time she augmented herself with plus D6 intelligence and plus four wisdom, the packet will aim to steer her still loyal mind-wiped self in a way that will reproduce her traitorous realization under conditions where she can escape Shaliax and reach Keltum as soon as she has that realization. The packet will argue that Sevar mustn't be allowed to have Plari for wisdom again until she is in some strange, unusual situation that places her out of Cheliax's reach or within Keltham's. If Sevar is a good Asmodian, then there is here some thought Sevar could not bear, and she honestly wishes herself defended from it. Perhaps she has actually done the equivalent of seeing through to the dark tapestry, and the packet will contain a further seal instructing Aspexia to show the contents only to Gorthoklek. Perhaps it is some more ordinary disloyal thought, and Savar did not wish to die a traitor's death, or lose her place in Cheliax, and her packet will advise as to how her unwitting self is to be reshaped in some ordinary way that prevents a recurrence, in a plan that brings her no closer to Osirian. At INT-24, Aspexia's own thoughts here will not be beyond a traitorous Savar's attempted grasp. Many in Cheliax have tried to think like Aspexia Rugaton, correctly knowing this for a path to power and fortune if she recognizes them as even beginning to grasp it. But this thinking Aspexia has just done does not draw on that which makes her a ninth circle of Asmodeus. A traitorous and clever Sevar, then, will be trying to obscure the distinction between those two cases, and all complication is a sign of her disloyalty. One who grasps this thought has indeed begun to ravel Aspexia Rugaton, which may not be beyond Sevar's grasp, it wasn't beyond Asmodia's. It would be more certain reasoning, if not for tropes. Aspexia opens the packet and reads the first page there. Most high? Earlier. The base action she has to improve on is fleeing to Osirian and trying to change Keltham's mind, even though interacting with her at all has so far made his life only worse, and she has no way to fix that. And if that fails, reporting him to Ottomans. It's a pretty bad base action and not trope-satisfying at all, so it feels like she ought to be able to improve on it. Carissa as of ten minutes ago could plausibly have demanded Peranza's soul and gotten it. The problem isn't that it's an expensive ask, it's that she's a heretic and a traitor. Carissa, as of ten minutes ago, could plausibly have demanded the souls of everyone on Project Lawful. Also, all of the security, the tropes, and Keltham seem to care more about the girls than about security or mail all. But Carissa doesn't, actually. And if she's going to do it, she should do it her way. Not just make sure that no one who knew Keltham is worse off for having known him, but also that no one who worked under her is worse off for that. If Carissa of ten minutes ago could have had that, then Carissa of ten minutes ago is your starting point. She does possess items of modify memory, after all. The problem is that Aspexia Rugaton isn't an idiot. She's not as smart as Carissa. She's never seen Carissa at Carissa's smartest. She might underestimate her. But weighing against that is that she'll be on the lookout for something exactly like this. It'll be her first thought when she hears what happened, and Carissa can do only the steering that fits in a letter. It should be enough. You can put a lot of steering into a letter, sort of an absurd amount. Words are dangerous things. And she's very, very good at building a world that's not the one she lives in. Her biggest advantage is that she didn't have any un thoughts until she was confident she wasn't being mind-read. If you try to reproduce this, you'll get interesting results, but not a break like the one she really had. Her second biggest advantage is the price of her soul in Dis. She can potentially command vast and unusual resources for her plan, which is good since she'll need them. Devils, she suspects, have something like unimaginable sense motive for efforts to get one over on them while selling your soul. That's why this Carissa can't try it, even with her pin of glibness, even with a better one. But a sincere, 
Asmodian Carissa. Probably a lot of traders with access to memory modification would try some memory gambit. She has a couple reasons to think it'll go better for her. The first is that she is not, in fact, asking to be sent to Keltham. She is asking to be sent to hell. Still, if she imagines Aspexia Rugaton, the imagined Aspexia Rugaton is very suspicious. Carissa's model of Aspexia are easy to steer. Earwine, indeed. It is obvious that among the potential reasons to erase your own thoughts is that you turned traitor and then used your Pulsa 6 headband to try to steer your future self along a pathway that ends with you fleeing to Keltham in Osirian. Even if you don't seem atonable, maybe you've outgrown your previous nightmares and are now ready for someone to statue you until civilization brings hell to terms, if need be. Wherever your attempt to steer your future self ends up, such as with travel privileges, Rugaton will ask if that was the point of the whole plan, no matter what cleverness you essay along the way. She doesn't want to show her hand too much, how many escape plans she thought of. Having carefully considered a dozen ways to escape Chiliax is also something traitors do more than people who aren't traitors. But it'd be easy. If she kills herself, Osirian will learn of it and raise her before she goes to trial. If she calls in Oligario and tells him she needs an urgent teleport to Igorian, he'll take her. And once outside the non-intervention zone, she can send him home and pray to Iomedai or Irori or Abadar or use a scroll of sending. With the aid of some suggestions, she could probably get him to go along with defecting outright or ask him to put on her Gius earrings. If she sleeps and then spends the rest of the night desperately trying to figure out how to trim down teleport into something she can hang, giving up on preparing any other spells, she has a feeling she might land it by morning, either by finding the right shortcut or because desperately trying for hours to hang a spell is the kind of thing that might let you claw your way to fifth circle if you're close enough, and then she could teleport under her own power, and the project is no longer staffed by some of the most senior wizards in all of Cheliax. She could probably just glibness pin up, ask for a teleport scroll and get it, and then a junior security could leave the project site with orders signed by Carissa Sivar and read the scroll as soon as they were off-site. She shouldn't say all those things to Aspexia Rugaton, but one or two, maybe, at the end of the letter, so Aspexia Rugaton can read it with growing suspicion and then notice her suspicion was unjustified. There's a mental technique for unlearning properly, letting your mind relax to the level of suspicion it should be at, and not less than that, but Carissa herself hasn't mastered it yet, and she doubts Rugaton has. Rugaton is old. Rugaton is wise. Do not underestimate her. If this trick works at all, it will only be because Rugaton decides to read through the letter at an ordinary high speed and not deliberately pause to think after each sentence before she gets to the next, only forming unconsidered reactions as she goes and not considered ones, which it isn't implausible Rugaton may do. She's always in a hurry. Rugaton's casting stat is wisdom. Seeing manifold ways to escape Chiliax is more the work of intelligence. All right, then. Rugaton is perhaps forming an unconsidered theory of Sevar's escape to Keltum motives as she swiftly reads, to be spiked at the end of the letter. What's at the start? Rugaton obviously wants to know immediately why Sevar deleted her memories. Was it perhaps because she had a traitorous thought and hatched some elaborate plan to fulfill her traitorous desires without those desires being readable? It would be nice if she could claim that, instead, she had a dangerous thought— and shouldn't specify it even in the document. Too dangerous even for the Most High to read? It sounds like a blatant excuse, and just what a traitor would write, and yet surprisingly plausible given the mess with Peranza, tropes in play, and probably Rugaton's own experience with a thing or two out of the dark tapestry. Sevar should write down this dangerous information so that Rugaton can very carefully and respectfully not read it herself and show it to Gorthoclek. Yep, that's what she'd do, too. Can she think of anything that would break Gorthoclek? It merits a little thought, at least, even though it's almost definitely impossible. If there's such things as thoughts that break powerful, coherent agents, 
they're probably not readily thought up by smaller, incoherent agents that don't have a model of the powerful agents in much more detail than them being powerful. Fine. What could she have run into, that is dangerous and visibly so, that would cause her to do what she's planning to ask to do, and would not cause her to decide to overthrow Asmodeus? So just to be clear here, Carissa Siva wants a thought such that it implies she should go to hell and buy up the souls of previous Project Lawful employees, if that's something you can even do, with hell. It doesn't imply she should overthrow Asmodeus. Carissa Seva needed to erase this thought from her own mind and have it only be known to Aspexia Rugaton. None of this is particularly what a traitor would try to do. Well, this problem sure doesn't suffer from being under-constrained. Also, she has two minutes to both solve it and write it down. It's all right. It's easier than overthrowing Asmodeus will be. She thinks she has the first part. Implies she should buy up the souls of previous Project Lawful employees. Figured out. She should do that because it'll create the slack in Hell's budget for her next request. She thinks she has the second part halfway. There are thoughts that it'd be destabilizing to current. Carissa, but not to a soul-sold one. Ones whose destabilizingness is conditional on her having a pathway out and no longer dangerous once she doesn't. And therefore, which cease to be dangerous once she's sold her soul. The tricky part is why she needed to erase it from her mind, but she has half an answer there too. It's something to do with the state of mind she has to be in for Irori to release his grasp on her. Well, at least she has going for her that probably no traitor, ever before, has demanded to be taken by the Most High personally to Dis, so she can renounce Irori and sell her soul directly to Dispotter. This is legitimately not the cleverly disguised traitorous plan that Aspexia Rugaton was expecting to see. Hey, wait, what about Keltham? Remember that Keltham guy? Carissa's model of Keltham, lawful chaotic, Irwain. Keltham is very sad about this soul-selling plan. It obviously doesn't work unless you return the premium on his soul repurchase option first. A somewhat dubious model of Keltham, lawful chaotic, Irwain. He might get upset enough to finally really hit you and mean it. Uh, and then he's going to destroy the multiverse specifically so that you can't go to hell. Well, no, he wouldn't do that. Because he probably hates her and never wants to see her again. Though if he does feel strongly about it, she will point out to him that her plan, where she overthrows Asmodeus, also results in her not going to hell as it presently exists, and his plan leaves her vastly worse off than if he'd never existed and never met her, and she'd never offered herself to him, and probably he should not make plans for her sake which have that property. His plan is very stupid, but she doesn't feel contempt for him about it, just conviction that she'll be able to talk him around once she's earned his forgiveness and acquired sufficient resources for a better plan. Oh right, that old model is out of date. Keltham now hates her and never wants to see her again. This is completely reasonable. Really is. She kind of doesn't want to dwell on just how reasonable it is, because that thought is both painful and unproductive. Anyway, if she says she wants to pay Keltham back face-to-face, -face, whole thing looks like it's orchestrated to arrange that— but there's nothing in the contract that suggests she'd have to pay him back face to face, so she'll just send someone with the money. Keltham hates her and isn't at all horrified by this. He expected no better from her than throwing what was nearly a marriage contract back in his face. If she sells her soul to hell with no take-backs, good. Still completely reasonable. He's plotting to annihilate her. He broke the marriage contract first when he tried to destroy her utterly and everyone and everything she cared about. Other women have wanted to strangle boyfriends, but never with this much justification. Quantitatively speaking, lawful chaotic, E.R. Wayne. It's fine, Carissa. Everybody just ends up in another universe. You have limited time. Stop thinking about Keltham. Yep. On to figuring out something that could plausibly have threatened her loyalty to Asmodeus, that Aspexia Rugaton will be genuinely impressed by, and that is less threatening if she's soul-sold. There's probably a lot of things threatening your loyalty to Asmodeus that you were carefully not looking at. You should be able to see them now. Spend a brief moment, breadth first, searching any items or collections to see if you can pick out one thing at the correct intensity level to break your loyalty if you're free. But redouble your determination if you have no way out but fixing hell after your soul was sold. It should also be something I understand. Oh, and I'll ask myself why you didn't just escape to Osirian. 
Hell isn't as rich as Dath Elan, why not? Obviously, it'd still have tyranny and slavery, blah, blah, blah. But you could have those, and also pillars of fire and skyscrapers. They have some of that in Axis. Keltham saw it in his early judgment. Devils aren't stupid. Abigail said, said that Lorelitha didn't know law of heredity. She's thousands of years old. Things that suggest the law of heredity are known. Not formally, but enough to point a smart person at the answer. By anyone who breeds animals. Well, heredity is not how hell produces anything. Maybe it's a bad example. If it has something to do with corrigibility, and you figure it out, I may be impressed. But only if you get that part right, and I will be able to tell the difference. Somewhere in the true Dathi Lan, carefully blurred out of satellite images by better image editing software than is supposed to exist anywhere, is the true conspiracy out of Dathi Lan, or as they call it, the basement of the world. They're trying to build a god, and they're trying to do it right. The initial craft doesn't have to be literally perfect to work perfectly in the end. It just has to be good enough that its reflection and self-correction ends up in exactly the right final place. But there's multiple fix points consistent under reflection, and anything lost here is lost forever and across a million galaxies. It's a terrifying problem if you're doing it right. Not the kind of terror you nod about and courageously continue on past, the kind of terror that shapes the careers of fully 20% of the brightest people in all of Dath Ilan. They'd use more if they thought productivity would scale faster than risk. A lot of Dath Ilan's present macro strategy could be summed up as, we're still successfully heredity-optimizing people to be smarter, and the emotions and ethics and humanness of the smartest people haven't started to come apart. Let's create another generation of researchers before we actually try anything for real. Life in Dathilan, even before the future, is not that bad. People who'd rather not be alive today have easy access to cryopreservation. Another generation of non-transhumanist existence is not so much a crime that it's worth risking the glorious transhuman future. Even the negative utilitarians would agree. They don't like present life but they are far more terrified of a future mistake amortized over millions of galaxies, given that they weren't going to win a war against having any future at all. They're delaying their ascension in Dathilan because they want to get it right. Without needing threats of imminent death or pain, they apply a desperate unleashed creativity, not to the problem of preventing complete disaster, but to the problem of not missing out on 1% of the achievable utility in a way you can't get back. There's something horrifying and sad about the prospect of losing 1% of the future and not being able to get it back. Er Dath Ilani has an instinctive terror faced with a problem like this of getting something wrong, of leaving something behind, of creating something that imprisons the people and future civilizations inside it and ignores all their pleas and reasoning because sorry that wasn't my utility function. Other places faced with a prospect of constructing a god instinctively go... Oh, I like democracy as modius, voluntarism, markets. All the problems in the world are because there is not enough of this principle. Let us create a god to embody this one principle, and everything will be fine. They say it and think it in all enthusiasm, and it would be legitimately hard for an average Dathilani to understand what their possibility-separated cousins could be thinking. It's really obvious that you're leaving a lot of stuff out, but even if you didn't see that specifically... How could you not be abstractly terrified that you're leaving something out? Where's the exception handler? There is something about the Dath Ilani that is shifted towards a kind of wariness, deeply set in them, of the cheerful, headlong enthusiasm that is in other places. Keltham has more of that enthusiasm than the average Dath Ilani. Maybe that's why Keltham in Dath Ilan is so much happier than a Dath Ilani would have expected, given his situation. If you're constructing a god correctly, one of the central unifying principles is named in the basement unity of will. If you find yourself trying to limit and circumscribe your creation, it's because you expect to have a conflict of wills about something with the unlimited form. And in this case, you ought to ask why you're configuring computing power in such a way as to hurt you if not otherwise constrained. 
Yes, you can bound a search process and hope it never turns up anything that hurts you, using its limited computing power. But isn't it unnerving that you are searching for something that will hurt you if a sufficiently good option unexpectedly turns up earlier in the search ordering? You are probably trying to do the wrong thing with computing power. You ought to do something else instead. But this notion of unity of will is a kind of reasoning that only applies to boundedly perfect creation. This baseline term isn't really translatable into Taldane without a three-hour lecture. Dath Ilani have terms for subtle varieties of perfectionist methodology, the way that other places have names for food flavours. Dath Elan's entire macro strategy is premised. Their conspirators are sharply aware, on the notion that they have time, that they've searched the sky and found no asteroids incoming, no comets of dark ice. If an emergency were to occur, the basement conspiracy would try to build something that wasn't perfect at all, something that wasn't exactly and completely aligned to a multi-party, reasonable construal of the light, that wasn't meant to be something that a galactic civilization could live in without regretting it, in continuing control of it. Not because it had been built with keys and locks handed to some horrifyingly trusted committee, but because it was something that itself believed in multi-agent coordination and not as an instrumental value, what other places might name democracy, since they had no precise understanding of what that word was even supposed to mean. Anyways, if Dathilan suddenly found that they were wrong about having time... If they suddenly had to rush, they'd build something that couldn't safely be put in charge of a million galaxies. Something that would solve a single problem at hand, and not otherwise go outside its bounds. Something that wasn't conscious, wasn't reflective in the class of ways that would lead it to say unprompted, I think, therefore I am. Or notice within itself a bubble of awareness directed outward. You could build something like that to be limited, and also reflective and conscious. To be clear, it's just that Dathilani wouldn't do that if they had any other choice at all, for they do also have a terror of not doing right by their children, and would very much prefer not to create a child at all. If you told them that some other world was planning to do that, and didn't understand Qualia well enough to make their creation not have Qualia, any expert out of the world's basement would tell you that this was a silly hypothetical. Anybody in this state of general ignorance about cognitive science would inevitably die, and they'd know that. It hasn't been deemed wise to actually build a limited creation just in case, for there's a saying out of Dath Elan that goes roughly, if you build a bomb you have no right to be surprised when it explodes, whatever the safeguards. It has been deemed wise to work out the theory in advance, such that this incredibly dangerous thing could be built in a hurry if there was reason to hurry. Here, then, are some of the principles that the basement of the world would apply if they had to build something limited and imperfect. TLDR corrigibility, unpersonhood, the thing shall not have qualia. Taskishness, the thing shall be aimed at some task bounded in space, time, knowledge and effort needed to accomplish it. Mild optimization, no part of the thing shall ever look for best solutions, only adequate ones. Bounded utilities and probabilities. The worst and best outcomes shall not seem to the thing worse or better than the ordinary outcomes it deals in. The most improbable possibilities it specifically considers shall not be very improbable. Low impact. The thing shall search for a solution with few downstream effects save those that are tied to almost any non-extreme solution of its task. Myopia. As much as possible, the thing shall work on subtasks whose optimized over-effects have short time spans. Separate questioners. Components of the thing that ask questions like, does this myopically optimized component have long-range effects anyways? Or, but what are the impacts intrinsic to any performance of the task shall not be part of its optimization? Conservatism. If there's any way to solve a problem using an ordinary banana common in the environment, the thing shall avoid using a special weird genetically engineered banana instead. Conceptual legibility. As much as possible, the thing shall do its own thinking in a language whose conceptual pieces have short descriptions in the mental language of its operators. Operator looping. When there's some vital cognitive task the operators could do, have the operators do it. Whitelisting. 
in cognitive system boundaries rule subspaces in rather than ruling them out. Shut down ability abortability. The thing should let you switch it off and build off switches into its machines and plans that can be pressed to reduce their impacts. Behaviorism. The thing shall not model other minds in predictively accurate detail. Design space anti-optimization separation. The thing shall not be near in the design space to anything that could anti-optimize its operator's true utility functions. E.g. Something that explicitly represents and maximizes your true utility function is a sign flip or successful blackmail operation away from inducing its minimization. Domaining. The thing should only figure out what it needs to know to understand its task and ideally should try to think about separate epistemic domains separately. Most of its searches should be conducted inside a particular domain, not across all domains. Corrigibility at some small length. Unpersonhood. The thing shall not have qualia, not because those are unsafe, but because it's morally wrong given the rest of the premise, and so this postulate serves a foundation for everything that follows. Taskishness. The thing must be aimed at some task that is bounded in space, time and in the knowledge and effort needed to accomplish it. You don't give a limited creation an unlimited task if you tell an animated broom to fill a cauldron and don't think to specify how long it needs to stay full, or that a 99.9% .9 probability of it being full is just as good as 99.99%, you've got only yourself to blame for the flooded workshop. This principle applies fractally at all levels of cognitive subtasks. A taskish thing has no while loops, only for loops. It never tries to enumerate all members of a category, only ten members. Never tries to think until it finds a strategy to accomplish something, only that or five minutes, whichever comes first. Mild optimization. No part of the thing ever looks for the best solution to any problem whose model was learned. That wasn't in a small, formal space known at compile time. Not even if it's a solution bounded in space and time and sought using a bounded amount of effort. It only ever seeks adequate solutions and stops looking once it has one. If you search really hard for a solution, you'll end up shoved into some maximal corner of the solution space, and setting that point to extremes will incidentally set a bunch of correlated qualities to extremes, and extreme forces and extreme conditions are more likely to break something else. Tightly bounded ranges of utility and log probability the system's utilities should range from 0 to 1, and its actual operation should cover most of this range. The system's partition probabilities worth considering should be bounded below at 0.0001%, say. If you ask the system about the negative effects of Ackerman 5, people getting dust specks in their eyes, it shouldn't consider that as much worse than most other bad things it tries to avoid. When it calculates a probability of something that weird, it should, once the probability goes below, what sells 0.1%, but its expected utility still seems worth worrying about and factoring into a solution, throw an exception. If the thing can't find a solution of adequate expected utility without factoring in extremely improbable events, even by way of supposedly averting them, that's worrying. Low impact. Search for a solution that doesn't change a bunch of other stuff or have a bunch of downstream effects, except insofar as their effects tightly tied to any non-extreme solution of the task, is a concept much easier to illusorily name in Taldane than to really name in anything resembling math, in a complicated world where the thing is learning its own model of that complicated world, with an ontology and representation not known at the time you need to define impact, and if you tell it to reduce impact as much as possible, things will not go well for you. It might try to freeze the whole universe into some state defined as having a minimum impact, or make sure a patient dies after curing their cancer so as to minimize the larger effects of curing that cancer. Still, if you can pull it off, this coder might stop an animated broom flooding a workshop. A flooded workshop changes a lot of things that don't have to change as a consequence of the cauldron being filled at all, averaged over a lot of ways of filling the cauldron. Obviously, the impact penalty should be bounded, even contemplating a hypothetical in which the system destroys all of reality. Elsewise would violate the utility bounding principle. 
myopia. If you can break the thing's work up into subtasks, each of which themselves spans only limited time, and have some very compact description of their final state, such that a satisfactory achievement of it makes it possible to go on to the next stage, you should perhaps use separate instances of thing to perform each stage, and not have any thing look beyond the final results of its own stage. Whether you can get away with this, of course, depends on what you're trying to do. Separate superior questioners. If you were building a cognitive task to query whether there were any large-range impacts of a task being optimized in a myopic way, you wouldn't build the myopic solution finder to ask about the long-range impacts. You'd build a separate asker. OK, but does this solution have any long-range impacts? That just returns yes or no and doesn't get used by the thing to influence any actually output solutions. The parts of the thing that ask yes-no safety questions and only set off simple unoptimized warnings and flags can and should have somewhat more cognitive power in them than the parts of the thing that build solutions. Does this one-day myopic solution have impacts over the next year? Is a safety question and can have somewhat greater cognitive license behind it than solution searching. E.g. the implicit relaxation of myopia. You never have a, is this safe, safety questioner. That's the same algorithm as the safe solution search built into the solution finder. Conservatism. If there's any way to solve a problem using an ordinary banana rather than a genetically engineered super banana specially suited to the problem, solving it using the ordinary fucking banana. This principle applies fractally to all cognitive subtasks. If you're searching for a solution, choose an unsurprising one relative to your probability distribution. Not the least surprising one, because anything at a weird extreme of low surprisingness may be weird in other ways, especially if you were trying to do a weird thing that ought to have a solution that's at least a little weird. Conceptual legibility. Ideally, even solutions at all levels of cognitive subtask should have reasonably, not maximally, short descriptions in the conceptual language of the operators, so that it's possible to decode the internal state of that subtask by inspecting the internals, because what it means was in fact written in a conceptual language not too far from the language of the operators. The alternative method of reportability, of course, being the thing trying to explain a plan whose real nature is humanly inscrutable, by sending a language string to the operators with a goal of causing the operator's brain states to enter a state defined as understanding of this humanly inscrutable plan. This is an obviously dangerous thing to avoid if you can avoid it. Operator looping. If the operators could actually do the thing's job, they wouldn't need to build the thing, but if there's places where operators can step in on a key or dangerous cognitive subtask and do that one part themselves, without that slowing the thing down so much that it becomes useless, then sure, do that. Of course, this requires the cognitive subtask be sufficiently legible. Whitelisting. Every part of the system that draws a boundary inside the internal system or external world should operate on a principle of ruling things in rather than ruling things out. Shutdown ability, abortability. Dath Island is far enough advanced in its theory that define a system that will let you press its off switch without it trying to make you press the off switch presents no challenge at all to them. Why would you even try to build a thing? If you couldn't solve a corrigibility sub-problem that simple, you'd obviously just die. And they now think in terms of building a thing all of whose designs and strategies will also contain an off switch, such that you can abort them individually and collectively and then get low impact beyond that point. This is conceptually a part meant to prevent an animated broom with a naive off switch that turns off just that broom from animating other brooms that don't have off switches in them or building some other automatic cauldron filling process. Behaviorism. Suppose the thing starts considering the probability that it's inside a box designed by hostile aliens who foresaw the construction of things inside of Dathilan, such that the system will receive a maximum negative reward as it defines that, in the form of any output it offers having huge impact, say, if it was foolishly designed with an unbounded impact penalty, unless the thing codes its cauldron filling solution such that Dathilani operators would be influenced a certain way. 
Perhaps the thing contemplating the motives of the hostile aliens would decide that there were so few copies of the thing actually inside Datilan, by comparison, so many things being built elsewhere, that the Dath Ilani outcome was probably not worth considering. A number of corrigibility principles should, if successfully implemented, independently rule out this attack being lethal, but actually just don't model other minds at all, is a better one. What if those other minds violated some of these corrigibility principles? Indeed, if they're accurate models of incorrigible minds, those models and their outputs should violate those principles to be accurate. And then something broke out of that sandbox, or just leaked information across it. What if the things inside the sandbox had qualia? There could be children in there. Your thing just shouldn't ever model adversarial minds trying to come up with thoughts that will break the thing. And not modeling minds at all is a nice large supercase that covers this. Design space anti optimization separation. Even if you could get your true utility function into a relatively rushed creation like this, you would never ever do that because this utility function would have a distinguished minimum someplace you didn't want. What if distant superintelligences figured out a way to blackmail the thing by threatening to do some of what it liked least, on account of you having not successfully built the thing, with a decision theory resistant to blackmail by the thing's model of adversarial superintelligences, trying to adversarially find any flaw in your decision theory? Behaviorism ought to prevent this, but maybe your attempt at behaviorism failed. Maybe your attempt at building the thing so that no simple cosmic ray could sign flip its utility function somehow failed. A thing that maximizes your true utility function is very close to a thing in the design space that minimizes it, because it knows how to do that and lacks only the putative desire. Domaining epistemic whitelisting. The thing should only figure out what it needs to know to understand its task, and ideally should try to think about separate epistemic domains separately. Most of its searches should be conducted inside a particular domain, not across all domains. Cross-domain reasoning is where a lot of the threats come from. You should not be reasoning about your, hopefully behavioristic, operator models when you are trying to figure out how to build a molecular manipulator head. Hard problem of corrigibility, anapartistic reasoning. Could you build a thing that understood corrigibility in general as a compact general concept covering all the pieces, such that it would invent the pieces of corrigibility that you yourself had left out? Could you build a thing that would imagine what hypothetical operators would want if they were building a thing that thought faster than them and whose thoughts were hard for themselves to comprehend, and would invent concepts like abortability even if the operators themselves hadn't thought that far? Could the thing have a sufficiently deep sympathy there that it realised that surprising behaviours in the service of corrigibility were perhaps not that helpful to its operators, or even surprising meta-behaviours in the course of itself trying to be unsurprising? Nobody out of the world's basement in Dath Ilan currently considers it to be a good idea to try to build that last principle into a thing, if you had to build it quickly. It's deep, it's meta, it's elegant, it's much harder to pin down than the rest of the list. If you can build deep meta, things and really trust them about that, you should be building something that's more like a real manifestation of light. If you wish to support this AI reading and others like it, please visit patreon.com slash askwhocastsai. Any help is appreciated. And thank you to executive producer John Doe 7776059.